Together with Jonathan Chu, Russell Wong, and our other co-organizers, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This new series will meet monthly, generally on the last Friday of each month, and it's a platform for people in central banks, academia, and elsewhere to get together and discuss policy-relevant research related to digital payments, digital currencies, and central banking. Each session will be hosted virtually by a different institutional partner. Today's host is the BIS, and I will now turn things over to our moderator for today, John Frost. Thanks a lot, Todd, and welcome to everyone. Uh, also from our end, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, welcome to this inaugural Central Banking and Digital Currencies Seminar. So we're really excited about this new series and we're glad to be able to take part on behalf of the Bank of International Settlements. So today we'll hear about new research uh, from Jun Song Shin, Raphael Auer, and Cyril Monet on the economics of permission distributed ledger technology. Um, we'll have 25 minutes for Hyun to present uh, followed by our discussant, Hannah Halleberda, uh, for 10 minutes, and then uh, Q&A. And my own role in this will be to promote Swiss timekeeping and to field all of the questions. Just a reminder to all participants to please use the Q&A box. So if you have a question to pose, uh, you can pose it in the Q&A box, and, uh, and we'll keep those uh, for the uh, Q&A session. Without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Hyun, who will present the paper. Thank you, John, and thank you, Todd. Uh, it's uh, really a, a great pleasure to, uh, to kick off uh, this very important initiative. Um, I'd like to present um, a recent paper with uh, Raphael Auer and Cyril Monet, uh, and they're here with me uh, on the panel. It's on uh, permission, the DLT, uh, and the governance of money. Um, I don't think I need to motivate uh, the questions in, in this audience. Um, the starting point is the idea that money can serve um, as a substitute for a, for a ledger uh, that records all past transactions. Uh, and in fact, uh, Narayana Kochalakota actually had a paper called Money is Memory. And the idea there was that uh, um, money can substitute for this uh, uh, theoretical ledger uh, in that if you're holding money, it's, uh, um, it's a sign of uh, goods sold in the past or services rendered, uh, and uh, it uh, does almost as well as uh, this uh, theoretical ledger. Uh, what's happened is that uh, this fanciful notion of a, a huge universal ledger has become uh, closer to reality, or indeed has really been put into reality, especially with the advent of uh, uh, distributed ledger technology and blockchain and uh, its application uh, in Bitcoin. Um, and this is the kind of picture we have in mind. Uh, we, um, we write um, uh, the history in a series of blocks, and then we have rules whereby uh, these, uh, these blocks are updated uh, uh, into a chain, and, the, and, and hence blockchain. Now, the fundamental question that I want to address, um, and this is a kind of very high level view um, is what is the uh, what are the respective advantages and dis uh, and disadvantages of a centralized versus distributed ledger? Um, I think there is a very um, uh, I think strong recognition that uh, distributed ledgers have this uh, robustness that come that comes from redundancy. And here I don't just mean you know keeping the same copies of the ledger uh, all over the place. It's more about governance in that it provides um, the checks and balances uh, that, uh, um, that mean that no single party has a monopoly on the truth, that uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can provide um, this check and balance for the whole system. It avoids uh, governance risks and you're not putting all the eggs in one basket. Now, set against this, there is also a very large economic cost, potentially. And, and, this, is, and this has to do with uh, what it takes to keep that cooperative or consensus mechanism going. In the case of uh, Bitcoin uh, and the proof of work uh, protocol, I mean, there's a, there's a special uh, element uh, you know, which has to do with the energy use and, uh, and the costliness of that is well known. But I, uh, but I want to um, highlight in this presentation something broader, which is 
to the extent that the decentralized consensus mechanism implies uh, a great deal of coordination, there has to be the proper incentive, uh, the incentive mechanism uh, that's in place to keep that uh, coordination going. And potentially you're gonna need uh, to divert a lot of resources to, uh, to provide the incentives to the, uh, uh, to the validators. So um, I don't need to uh, tell this audience this, uh, uh, this uh, distinction between permissionless DLT, which is uh, uh, typified by Bitcoin, where uh, anyone can join and, uh, and um, act as a validator. For um, uh, enterprise use, there is now uh, a number of well-known permission versions of DLT where uh, not everyone can join and um, uh, stamp themselves as a self-appointed validator. You need to be permitted to come in and be um, appointed as a validator. Uh, and the reason for this has been that uh, um, although DLT uh, as a notion is very elegant uh, and uh, the way the Bitcoin protocol works is also um, uh, you know, theoretically very elegant in that uh, it, it has this uh, common knowledge element all the way through. You can look at the history of all past transactions, and that is, if you like, the governance mechanism that, that, that gives it uh, robustness. But it's uh, less than well suited for real life uh, transactions when you have to guard uh, um, client privacy. So, for example, if you're a bank, if you're a commercial bank and you're uh, making payments on behalf of your clients, it's hardly going to be um, uh, you know, feasible for you to just uh, publish everything on the internet as to what your clients uh, are doing on their account. And um, uh, there, are, there are privacy issues. There are, uh, so there's, there's a variety of issues where you want to be able to uh, combine both the robustness, but also the governance that have to do with uh, maintaining privacy uh, and guarding against um, uh, illicit finance and anti-money laundering and so on. So what we want uh, is to look at uh, permission distributed ledgers. There is a known uh, and set group of validators and their role um, is to look at the, um, uh, look at the transactions, uh, do the checks, and as a group, opine on whether the, uh, um, the particular manifestation of the block accords with their own record. And then they're going to provide an opinion as to whether that block is correct or not. And uh, what we're gonna be looking at is uh, a voting mechanism uh, as a kind of typical form of this uh, permission ledger where you need a supermajority of the validators to vote yes in order for that uh, uh, new block to be then appended to the existing chain. And here, uh, uh, um, in the real-world applications of, uh, of CBDC, wholesale CBDCs, uh, that the Bank of Canada, that uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, and many other central banks have actually um, uh, implemented and uh, experimented uh, with, um, uh, there is also this uh, hierarchical notion where um, sometimes um, yeah, there could be a central notary who has the full view of everything. But then, uh, but uh, individual participants will not have the full view, and the, uh, they will only know the transactions on a need-to-know basis. So, what do um, so what do we do in this paper concretely? So, what we want to do is to write down an economic model. There will be some scope for gains from trade, and uh, it's going to be a very standard uh, model that's used in monetary economics. Um, where there's a coordination element. And uh, in the absence of informational constraints, uh, when uh, all the actions are commonly known to everyone, uh, there, there are well-known implementations of the efficient outcome through standard uh, trigger strategy type of uh, uh, mechanisms. However, the, the friction in this model is gonna be that we don't have that common knowledge. We have to keep track of uh, the actions of all the participants in the economy 
through a real world ledger. And uh, having this reconciled ledger uh, in this distributed setting that uh, records all past transactions in a truthful way is a public good. It's a very important public good that enables uh, uh, um, the economic participants to reap the gains from trade. However, there are going to be costs that are incurred by the validators. And the question is, how do you incentivize the validators to do the right thing? And um, there, there is firstly a coordination element in that uh, you know, if you have a super majority rule, you can really only uh, gain the benefits of um, having this public good if enough of the other validators also contribute. So there's gonna be a public good contribution game element, and we're gonna formalize that as a global game. The, the, the main result of the paper is then to use um, these uh, games, uh, this global game uh, set of results as an input into solving for the optimal design of the permission ledger. So how many validators, what supermajority threshold do you need uh, in order to get the, uh, uh, the maximum uh, surplus from, from this economy? And there are two uh, forces at work, and this is the tension that we explore in this paper, which is that on the one hand, you need a lot of validators and distributed ledgers in order to guarantee strong governance. Because um, you know, if you have one validator who can be corrupted, for example, then uh, you know, that's, a, uh, you know, that's a danger that uh, um, a distributed ledger can guard against. And uh, in this sense, it's much more expensive to pervert history if you want to uh, bribe a lot of validators than just one. On the other hand, there is an inefficiency cost that comes from having many validators because of the inherent coordination issue here. And because money is a social convention, because money is a coordination device, this is a, you know, a feature of the monetary system that we cannot ignore. Um, so let me uh, just introduce the model. Um, so this is a very standard uh, model you see in monetary economics where time is discrete. There's a discount factor. Uh, and then each period is divided into an early production and a late production period. And uh, uh, there is an efficient outcome where uh, if the match is good, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, the the noise uh, uh, you know, that might uh, um, intervene. But um, typically what uh, would happen is two um, producers would meet. One is an early producer, one is a late producer. They would like to trade with each other. The early producer should produce for the late producer and then the late producer then reciprocates by producing, having uh, obtained uh, that first good. However, because this is uh, going to be happening in sequence, unless there is something to stop the second late producer from reneging on some promise, uh, uh, you're going to get uh, uh, autarky as the only equilibrium outcome. And so this is why you need a ledger to keep track of the, um, uh, of the actions of these producers. And uh, um, typically in monetary economics, and uh, this is paper by uh, Chu and Koppel, this is a very good example. Um, what you need is uh, some kind of uh, threat. And uh, the simplest way of doing it is just to use a trigger strategy, where uh, if you have ever deviated in the past, then uh, you're branded as a bad type, and then no one ever cooperates with you ever. And that's a credible threat that uh, ensures that uh, uh, you, you always reciprocate in case you're the, the late producer. Um, so the, the only twist, and this is going to be the really important twist, is that we're going to be keeping track uh, of the actions of all the participants in the economy through uh, a distributed ledger. So first of all, we're going to be solving the second stage of the game where we fix the number of um, validators, we fix the supermajority threshold, solve for the global gain, and solve for the allocation subject to uh, um, uh, these fixed assumptions. 
And then we go back to the first stage of the game and solve for the optimal outcome by varying the number of validators and the supermajority threshold. So that's, so, uh, that's more of a mechanism design problem subject to the constraints that are provided by the, uh, by the global game solution. Uh, so I think this is a good uh, moment, John, to, for me to pause in case there are any uh, questions on the model. Absolutely. Any clarifying questions? I think there are two in the Q&A that I see. Uh, one from Fernando Alvarez. Ah, so uh, yes. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. So uh, Cyril is typing an answer, Fernando. Yeah. So it is, um, so each period has two, uh, so each period has uh, early production, late production, but it's a discrete time infinite horizon model. So are there further questions of clarification from the panelists or from anyone else? If not, then I suggest people can continue with the Q&A box. Okay, so let me go on. So um, the, uh, the twist in, the, in, in this model is that uh, the validator has to incur a cost and it's an idiosyncratic cost uh, to validate. So at the very least, what you need to do uh, is to scoop up the various transactions and then see whether the transactions uh, actually match with your own observation. So you have to expend some effort. And we're assuming that uh, that effort is going to be chi i for uh, validator i. Now, um, we're going to have a supermajority um, consensus protocol such that if more than kappa uh, of, the, uh, of the validators um, provide the same exact same um, validated ledger, then that is the uh, uh, that is that becomes the valid block. Okay. Um, now in that case, you're going to be paid uh, this amount Z or Z. And the F here, F is the noise where uh, some proportion of the late producers actually turn out to be uh, unproductive workers. So they're unproductive. This is just a noise uh, to give the <clears throat> to provide some kind of uh, um, uh, um, so it's, it's a kind of seed of doubt, which we'll uh, which we'll use later. Uh, but the payoff is this one here, which is uh, that provided that um, uh, so so it's a it's a binary action game. You either work or you shirk. If you shirk, then your payoff is zero. Um, uh, and we normalize the, the payoff to shirk to zero. The payoff to work is going to be uh, this two part uh, uh, payoff that you see on the screen. If more than um, this kappa hat threshold uh, actually work, they will get the correct um, update to the ledger, in which case everyone who has contributed um, is going to be paid uh, one minus F times Z. So one minus F is the surplus to the whole economy uh, and, uh, and, and Z or Z is the, is the payoff to a particular uh, validator. You have to incur the cost anyway, that's chi I. Um, and so we have a public good contribution game where there's a threshold kappa hat. If more than kappa hat, contribute to the public good, then everyone who's provided the good is going to be capturing the, the high payoff. However, if uh, not enough contribute, then your cost is wasted. So you just incur the uh, cost chi i and not uh, uh, obtain the benefit. Now, um, for ease of the solution, what I'm going to do is just to normalize the payoff. And I'm going to um, define C of I just to be the normalized cost. So it's this. Um... Okay, I don't see a pen here, but uh, if you look at the middle of the screen, um, it, we're just normalizing the payoff so that the benefit to um, the public good is normalized to one, uh, and the the cost is re uh, is relative to that uh, uh, is to that benefit so that uh, we can just parameterize the public good contribution game as uh, uh, the payoff that you see above. So provided that 
the supermajority threshold Kappa hat um, is reached and exceeded, those validators who have contributed to this um, uh, validated and reconciled ledger collect the payoff of one. And then they pay uh, this cost C. Now, for future reference, notice that C can be low when uh, Z is high. In other words, if you're um, willing to provide a lot of rents to the validators and provide a lot of surplus to the, to the miners, if you like, yeah, who are the validators who update the ledger, then you can bring down the cost. So it's as if uh, there is a, uh, so it's, uh, so there is a distributional element uh, to this problem as well in that, yes, you can make the cost of public good contribution very, very low, provided you're willing to give a lot of the surplus to the validators. Now, the key here, of course, is, uh, and this is what makes the global game solution work, um, is the fact that uh, we, we have uh, a, uh, an element here where there is strategic uncertainty. And we're going to get this through a uh, so-called private values version of a global game. And, and the idea here is that CI is going to be distributed um, around some common element theta. And uh, the idiosyncratic component in the cost is uniformly distributed um, over a very small interval and it's IID, and uh, we're going to be taking the epsilon to zero and taking the limits. It's, um, um, it's a private values global game uh, in the sense that the, uh, you know your cost, um, and you're going to be choosing your action based on the cost. It's different from the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the version where you think of the, uh, uh, the signal as um, uh, the truth plus some noise. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, that. That's a public values global game, if you like. Anyway, a well known a, a, a well known result in in global games is that uh, if you assume that everyone uh, follows a switching strategy, in other words, uh, that everyone um, so there is some threshold C star such that all the people who have a cost below C star are going to work. All the people who have a cost above C star will not work. So, so, so uh, suppose that there is such a threshold and suppose that everyone follows uh, this switching strategy. Then um, if you happen to be exactly at that threshold, then your belief over the proportion of people who are working is actually uniform over the unit interval. So there's radical uncertainty, if you like, over the proportion of people who are actually cooperating in this, uh, in this coordination game. And the intuition here, uh, and there's a proof in the paper, it's uh, as we just uh, put the proof in the paper just for completeness. Uh, the intuition here is that this little noise in the, uh, in the cost of validation injects radical uncertainty in the sense that even though the noise is small, what's important here is the order statistic. Uh, so the question is, is your cost the highest, the lowest, uh, or something in between? Are you the median? Uh, which percentile are you? And uh, uh, provided that the prior gives no, uh, no information and the noise is also uniform, it's, it's obvious in that case that uh, my signal tells me nothing about uh, um, where I, uh, you know, where I lie uh, in the in the distribution uh, over the cost for the whole population. So I have radical uncertainty over the order uh, the order statistic, and in that sense, um, I'm equally likely to be the highest uh, as the lowest, as uh, anywhere in between. And so, because you're actually at the threshold, and the proportion who cooperate are those people who have a signal lower than me, then that proportion must also be uniform. Okay, so that's the, so that's the intuition. Now, this is a, this is a really a very nice lemma for us to solve the problem because um, imagine that you have uh, this kind of picture where uh, you think of the proportion who, um, who actually verify the ledger distributed on this unit interval. Well, we know that uh, if the, 
uh, distribution. So if the realization of kappa falls below the threshold, then you get the bad outcome. If the proportion who cooperate is bigger than the threshold, you get the good outcome. Well, this is the payoff function you see uh, over that unit interval. And because we know it's uniform, the distribution at that threshold, we can solve for the threshold by looking at the C star, whereby the area of the rectangle A is exactly equal to the area of the rectangle B. So that's a very, very simple solution. And then the second part of the proof just says, well, um, it turns out that you can solve the game through iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies. So you start with, in, in the usual way, there are dominance regions, and then you solve a way. Um, and it turns out that uh, this threshold equilibrium is, in fact, not the only uh, equilibrium in threshold strategies. It's the only equilibrium full stop, because that's the way you solve the game. Um, so what this gives us is a really simple solution method, uh, whereby let's just solve for the game. Uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the cooperation uh, mass is less than the threshold, you get minus C. That's the first term. If the cooperation threshold is bigger than kappa hat, you get one minus C. That's the second term. Uh, well, you solve for C star and uh, you get this, uh, this expression one minus kappa hat. In other words, you get this kind of threshold, uh, you, you get this kind of picture. And this is the, um, uh, if you like, the punchline uh, of the solution. The horizontal axis gives you the kappa hat. That's the supermajority voting threshold. And you're asking, what is the marginal type below which people will contribute, above which the validators will not contribute? And it's, that's, and it's just this, uh, vertical, uh, this diagonal red line that goes through the diagonal. Um, and so in, this, uh, so in the limit, when epsilon goes to zero, there is a unique dominant solvable equilibrium where the public good is provided if and only if you lie below uh, that red line. In other words, this is the picture. So you can divide uh, the universe of um, parameters uh, exactly down the middle like this. If you're in the blue area, you were successful in uh, achieving decentralized consensus in updating uh, the, the ledger. If you're above the red line, you just don't have enough um, rents going to the validators in order to successfully uh, update the ledger. Um, now the one, so if you find yourself in the white area, like, uh, like you see here initially, you have to bring uh, the cost of contribution down in order for you to successfully produce that public good. In other words, uh, imagine, uh, so in the case of uh, Bitcoin, Imagine that the, that the blocks that go to the miners uh, are getting smaller and smaller, which is, uh, which is what's happening. At some point, relative to the cost uh, of, uh, of being a miner, it's just not gonna be worth your while. So even with the fees and everything, of course the way to, um, so what this says is you need to give more rents to the validators in order to get the whole consensus mechanism going again. So what this does, is to give us a very um, uh, clear boundary as to what's feasible. And so the punchline is, well, suppose we're gonna be using a distributed ledger like this. And we think of a universal um, and very realistic mechanism where we're thinking of the validators not simply as automata, but actually uh, self-interested uh, parties, you know, as all the, all the miners are in Bitcoin. And they're doing it because it's in their interest <clears throat> to be miners. So they're valid. So in our model, the validators are also the late producers uh, in this, in this two-step model. In that kind of situation, we have to allow for the possibility of side payments. So uh, it is possible that, you know, so if you have a small number of validators, you can go and bribe them and get them to, uh, um, uh, allow you to double spend. Let's just think about that as a possibility. What would actually uh, um, uh, make uh, the governance of money uh, something that's a result uh, um, of a robust 
mechanism? And that's the question we actually address. And so let me finish with this final slide, which is the, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, which is the punchline of the paper. So uh, let me uh, uh, introduce pi as the probability that uh, a bribe is uncovered. And alpha is probably, so alpha is a parameter that I didn't explain, but it's, uh, it's basically the probability of the match. It's how much surplus you can, you can get from the match. And uh, beta is just, the, uh, is just the discount factor. This parameter delta is the key. So delta being very high is the case where uh, you care about the distant future. You, um, uh, you know, this is a very uh, well-governed society where bribes are actually uncovered. And the optimal minority arrangement depends on delta. And we can have a whole range of different arrangements depending on the configuration of these parameters. So in a high delta society, it actually turns out that a centralized ledger is optimal. And you just uh, make sure that uh, the, the centralized uh, um, uh, validator has a very, very high rent. Uh, and so is immune to bribery. So that's the kind of, you know, uh, it's a very stripped down model. Uh, we can think about, uh, you know, it, it just opens up a whole new set of uh, issues to, to do with governance here and the politics of all this. But in the simple model, that's the result. As Delta goes down, this is when the, uh, the distributed ledgers now really come in. So when Delta falls, permission distributed ledger with a small number of validators is optimal. As Delta falls and falls and falls, you need more and more of these validators come to, to come in. Below a certain threshold, you want everyone to be there. You want everyone to be there because you want the maximum governance uh, safeguard. But then if you go below a certain threshold, there's just no economic gains that can be reaped. So, um, so even this very small change from the full information gain is going to just uh, uh, really uh, inject a great deal of richness to, uh, to the economics of the institutions. Here. So let me finish there, John. Thanks so much, Jim. So we'll now turn to our discussant, uh, Hannah Halliburda. Uh, Hannah, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. It will be quite a feat to do it in 10 minutes. I uh, guess, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. I'm, I'm very excited and I have lots of things to say. So I, I, I already uh, uh, selected only some. Um, and, uh, and I, uh, I, I will aim at 10 minutes. So uh, this is uh, clearly a very um, you know, important and insightful paper. Uh, and not only because it's a timely topic, we have had quite, a, uh, you know, quite already a significant uh, amount of research on permissionless uh, blockchains. And now this is, um, we're turning to, to analyze, more closely analyze permission systems. And this paper, is the first paper to analyze the incentives in permission system in such a great detail. And this is, uh, th this is really, really great. Uh, what it allows us to do is to learn about the complexity of economic forces that are involved in incentivizing the validators in, the, in a permission system which is different than, uh, than permissionless system. But, and it also illustrates the general issues that we are up against in analysis of permission, uh, permission blockchains. And I'm going to kind of focus on that. The paper has three parts. Uh, there is a model of trade and uh, there is a validation game and then there is the optimal design part. I'm in my remarks, I'm going to only focus on the validation, uh, validation game. Um, to uh, again to to kind of uh, limit limit myself so uh the validation game has two stages um the validators are validating first the label of the producer and then they are they are validating the production that has uh, that has occurred and in both stages they need to do they need to actually verify uh the information and then they are voting by sending a message Right? Uh, so they, they do it twice in two different contexts. Both verification and sending messages is costly. And this, um, 
uh, this means that the validators need to be compensated if uh, we want to keep them participating in the system. They, are, they don't have to participate uh, and they are opportunistic or self-interested in the sense that they will only participate if it makes sense for them, if it's, if it's profitable. And uh, once we uh, account for the fact that they, are, uh, they respond to incentive and they want to be uh, compensated for uh, verification and sending messages, they are also subject to bribes. And uh, so we need to have a system that is both compensating the, the validators and also preventing them to, uh, to take bribes so that the system uh, will be uh, trusted. Uh, what makes things worse is that uh, the validators get their payoff, they are getting compensated only if sufficient number of other validators also validates the state and the state is good. So uh, it creates, uh, it, it gives rise to a coordination game where uh, a validator may not find it worthwhile to validate and exert this costly effort if he does not believe that sufficiently large number of other validators will also do the same. So if we believe that other people are not going to validate, we're not going to validate as well, which will be a disaster for the for the uh, for the distributed distributed ledger so uh, this uh, coordination game is solved pretty ingeniously uh, as a global game where the, uh, there is a variable cost of sending information in the syncretic cost of sending information this is private information it's uh, in the syncretic cost of sending messages which is private information and uh, this allows um, uh, allows the authors to solve this as a quite complicated global uh, uh, global games game, but it yields uh, quite clear solutions, and uh, uh, and the solutions are well. First of all, if we have a uh, larger majority role, so the, it was Tao in the paper, and I noticed that it was K Hat in the presentation. So if we have higher supermajority rule, it, going, it is going to limit incentive for bribes, bribes which makes system more secure, but then it also makes, um, uh, makes it more costly to prevent free riding and, the, and provision of the public good. So there is a, there is a need to balance, uh, uh, balance those forces and there is an optimal, uh, optimal K hat to be derived. Uh, it also, we get the result that if we require, require unanimity, so K hat would be 100% and the public good will not be provided at all. And under certain conditions, we also see that uh, having a centralized, uh, uh, centralized system where there is only a single validator is it's better. So what the model provides in you know, all those 90 pages and, and very complicated steps, it's, it's very... Um, a uh, very important insight into how to incentivize the validators to do their job in this, in this particular setting. And it also gives a roadmap of how to do it in other settings. What, what worries me uh, a little bit is that some of those results are almost assumed uh, because the model fails to tackle the issue of why do we need, to do, do we need the validators to do their job at all? So uh, there uh, it has been remarked of, you know, why do we need distributed, uh, distributed ledger? Because it's going to provide some governance benefits, checks and balances, not only redundancy, so on. But this is not in the model. And this, in fact, is not a critique of just this paper. This is what we see um, in, uh, in the nascent literature of economic analysis of permissioned blockchains is that it is not really clear what we want the distributed system to achieve. And we uh, focus on the cost and, and, and uh, is incentivizing the distributed system to arise without incorporating the other side. And I'm going to claim that we cannot uh, model only one side without modeling the other. Uh, so, uh, you know, on the face of it, uh, we say that the validators allow us to maintain the ledger. So let me actually you know, ask, what is the ledger? The, we, can, we have heard about the ledger in the presentation and in the paper, it's uh, the ledger is mentioned many, many times. So what is the ledger in a distributed system? So first of all, we have many validators 
And each of the validators in a distributed system is keeping a copy of a ledger. The issue is that those copies may differ. Right? And the point is that it's not the ledger, but how are we going to reconcile and provide consistency for many, many ledgers? Okay? And so if we consider that all nodes are equal and they are opportunistic, they are self-interested, uh, and there is no special node that would be more important than others, then maintaining consistency of the ledger between the nodes, the nodes is a major challenge. So all permissionless systems have this setup where all nodes are equal and there is no one more important node. And many of the permissioned systems also have this setup that once permissioned, no node is more important than others, okay? So how do we maintain consistency of the ledger? Well, you know, the, 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 our instinct is let's get, let's get nodes to vote, okay? And this is the, the tool that is being, being used in many of the papers on permission blockchains. Now that we know the identity of the nodes, we can ask them to vote. Here's a problem with that. Who would tally the votes? Okay, if in the typical voting system, you go to a, to a, a voting booth, you need to have a whole committee that is going to tally the votes. Okay, and do you trust that entity to tally the votes correctly? If you don't have any special node that is more important than others, you can't do just simple voting where everybody votes into one place, because then you would need to trust the, the entity that is collecting the votes. And then this would make this entity a special node, a more trusted node than other nodes, because otherwise this entity may be also opportunistic and may misreport what the notes, uh, what the what the votes of the nodes have said, okay? So what typically is done in this um, in this in distributed systems where all nodes are equal, we have local local voting. So all nodes send their votes to all other nodes, and everyone everyone tallies their votes, tallies the votes that they get locally, the votes that they get, and I see whether I'm getting you know eighty percent of white or eighty percent of of black. The issue with that is that nodes can send different votes to different recipients. And this is a major problem because the, my tally of the votes may be different than your tally. I have tallied all the votes and I see 80% of votes for white, but you can have 80% of votes for black. And I know that you actually may have a different threshold, I mean, different, uh, different votes than I have. So what we, what we need, we need multiple rounds to reconcile and make sure that we update the ledger the same way. So I collect the votes I get with the signature of the, of the nodes that voted. And I'm sending to everybody else, not only my vote, but all the other votes that I have gotten from all the other nodes. And then we kind of, we iterate until we agree what is going to be the, uh, the update on the ledger, okay? Now- I had a one this, minute warning. Yeah, no, so that, this is why PBFT, Byzantine Fault Tolerant Mechanisms, are so much more complicated than just voting. And you can not only take whole courses on this, you can build your whole academic career around, the, around how to solve this problem. Okay, so what is happening in this, in this paper? Obviously, we do not have all the system. We have simple voting. This you can do when there is one node that is more important. And in the paper, there is a notary. So this node keeps the authoritative copy, and this is why we can call it the ledger, and tallies the validator's votes, okay? So now do we trust this node to write in the ledger what the nodes have voted, voted for? Well, obviously we need to trust this, uh, we, we do trust this node, at least in the paper. So is there any accountability of that node? Do we even consider the possibility that the node, the, the notary is going to lie? And then if, the, if we trust the, the notary, then what do validators do that the notary cannot, okay? And this kind of brings us to the question is, what do we need the validators for really? And what do we expect the decentralized system to achieve in permission setting? Okay, so one could be consensus where no node is more important than other. This is clearly not what is going on here. The other is the validators may be checking consistency of the ledger by keeping the notary in, in check 
for misreporting, right? Again, this is not modeled in this paper. We assume that notary is always trustworthy, okay? So what the validators seem to be doing is that they are aggregating some disparate information from outside of the ledger. So they behave as oracles. But then this is not really about the ledger keeper, about keeping of the ledger. This is about information, aggregating of the information. And we already have literature on that. They behave as oracles, okay? And, but whatever we expect from the decentralized system is we should not expect cost savings because by definition, there are redundancy in operations. So there must be many, many times that the validation needs to take place and it is going to be costly. So we need to kind of figure out why do we want them to do that? Okay, so uh, let me just you know, take a, a, a 30 seconds to, to show why this is a problem if we do not model those things at the same time for this particular game. So what the validators bring to this particular game? Uh, first, they validate the label. So they verify, verify the label of producers which they read from the ledger, it is at the notary. And then they vote by sending the message to the ledger. So what wasn't this information already there in the ledger? And if they are not sending this message to the ledger, but instead sending the message to the early producer, then they are basically serving as a connection between the ledger and the real world and then back. But then this is a different task than maintaining the ledger, okay? And then in the second uh, phase of the validation, the production validation, they're supposed to verify whether production took place according to the plan. So uh, do they have boots on the ground and they actually observe, or do they, act, do, do they just take the report of the producers signed by the, signed, by, signed by the producers? And do they have the same data or do they have a noisy signal that we need to aggregate, right? And is this something that the, our trusted notary cannot observe directly? So other, uh, in other words, what is the benefit of the redundancy, okay? And uh, it, if, uh, uh, what I'm claiming is that all those rules about the majority, how many nodes we need to validate may actually depend on what do we expect to gain from this, uh, from this distributed system, okay? I am going to uh, skip the last couple of comments and I'm happy to discuss them with the authors on the, on the side. But to sum up, it is a, you know, a great paper, really a great analysis in detail of the incentive system of, uh, to incentivize validator. And it is extremely important because it is getting us thinking about not only incentives and the optimal design of a particular permission system, but also about the challenges in analyzing permission systems itself. So not only it is already complicated, you know, I'm claiming it's not complicated enough. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to the to the authors, but I think there is there is more to there is more to be learned. But we wouldn't be able to get there without the paper as it, as it already is. So uh, let me stop here and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. So I would like to give Hyun the uh, opportunity to respond to those comments first, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Hyun. Well, Hannah, that's, uh, uh, that's a great discussion. I think that's really very deep. Um, I'm going to, uh, because it's so deep, I'm going to um, just let my co-authors uh, address that. Uh, <laughs> so Raphael and Cyril, up to you. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thanks, Anna, for, uh, for the discussion. It was very interesting. So the, the way that we were thinking about it was that um, what you call the notary would actually be a program that would be contained on the ledger. And the program would actually just count votes. Okay, that's the way we would think about it. Um, now, you know, maybe uh, we need, I mean, you know, in some sense, we need to go deeper and understand, you know, where this program is coming from. Why do people agree to this program in the first place? But this, we took it as given uh, in, this, in this setup. Um, the other thing was, you know, who communicates with the ledger uh, with the validators, it's actually, you know, the producers themselves. And in particular, you know, one idea of having a permissioned ledger is that you want to preserve anonymity and in particular had anonymity of history. And so when two producers meet, you actually don't want these producers to have access to the ledger. So that's why you have this extra, you know, to preserve anonymity of previous trades. 
And so that's why you have an additional, um, I would say, layer of validators. And these guys are preventing you to have access to the ledger. So they control access of the ledger. Um, but, you know, it's great that, you know, there's still work to do because, uh, you know, that's how research should go. So, um, but thanks for the comment. So, um, Hannah, I think your point about the central notary is a very good one. And, uh, you know, as you know, some, um, some formalizations of the distributed ledger, these permission DLT actually have, uh, you know, like, uh, um, like Corda, uh, you know, they, it actually has a you know, single notary. And the, and the reason um, for that actually uh, also has to do with um, some of the legal underpinnings of what actually counts as a, uh, as a settlement. So for example, in a securities transaction, you need a timestamp. Um, and uh, you know, if you had many different uh, uh, notaries and you had different timestamps, there are all kinds of legal problems that actually come from that. So um, you know, there, there, there are other reasons why you would need a notary. Um, I think you know, our model probably uh, you know, can be specified in a way you know, which would be consistent with the, um, well, taking into account the full variation. Um, but uh, uh, we have to admit that, well, I certainly have to admit that I was taking it uh, in a much more naive way that, you know, it, it was just a matter of voting. So I'd like to invite further questions. Uh, first of all, among the panelists, uh, would anyone like to pose questions to Hyun, uh, Raphael and Cyril? Um, I would. <clears throat> Please, uh, go ahead. So uh, it was really interesting paper and a really interesting set of comments there. Uh, uh, it's fascinating to listen to. Uh, I think that the uh, comments actually help us see that this is building up from a particular direction where um, the um, global games uh, literature has been used uh, quite a bit to think about banks. And I can see an underpinning of this story as being a story about banks and bank runs. That is to say, these, are, these guys are also thought, could be thought of as the oracles who are the monitors watching out whether a bank is um, doing the right thing or not. And the majority vote is, is, is closing down the bank. And in that respect, I was wondering, reinterpreting it in that way, what's the new version, what's the additional elements in this story that, um, uh, that, that build on that, on, that, on that previous existing literature? And I guess the answer I'm proposing, but I'd like to get your re reaction to it, is that we're imagining here something about the corruptibility of the um, holders of uh, very junior debt. That is, we want to have the guys out there holding junior debt as natural monitors of a bank. And we're worrying about the fact that we have too few of those natural monitors. They might be out there um, uh, uh, being bribed by the bank itself to, uh, to give invalid reports. Have I got that right? Is there more than that in the story or what other pieces are missing? Yeah, I think, uh, Charlie, I think the, um, the second part of the paper about uh, uh, corruptibility and the, and the side payments, I mean, that's, if you like, building on top of the underlying coordination problem. Uh, you know, I think the commonality there is the coordination problem and the idea that um, if you have a global game uh, a formulation of a coordination problem, you would normally expect to see some uh, inefficiency because... Um, because of the radical strategic uncertainty that I mentioned. And, uh, and so um, you have to give a lot of surplus to the people playing that coordination game in order for you to get the cooperative outcome. And this is why um, expecting unanimity is, so if, if there is one uh, very strong result that I just want to leave you with, expecting unanimity is just too much. Uh, the reverberant doubt, if you like, is just, uh, so if, if you recall this paper, uh, you know, this book by um, uh, Douglas Hofstadter, uh, Gertel Escherbach, uh, he, he, you know, he talked about reverberant doubt, where, you know, um, yes, there is a cooperative uh, outcome there, but if you need everyone to do the right thing, and doing the right thing is costly, then you begin to wonder, you know, is, uh, you know, even if I do the right thing, and even if all my neighbors, virtually all my neighbors do the right thing, you know, am, am I really so sure that there isn't someone out there, uh, you know, who wasn't paying attention and who might actually press the wrong button. And then, if you know, if you catch yourself thinking that way, well, maybe everyone else is having the same doubt about this someone who wasn't paying attention 
Uh, and, uh, and that means that, you know, this kind of doubt reverberates. Um, and the global game solution is just a, it's just a formalization of that DAO. And you need a huge surplus that, to go to the cooperative uh, um, you know, players in order for you to overcome that DAO. And so um, in any case, what we, so, so what this says is uh, when you create that uh, supermajority game, you had better not um, build in something like unanimity. You need, you need something which is reasonable uh, to, to overcome this reverberant DAO. How does the do? How does the two-step version of the of validation affect the, the game, the, the structure? I mean, the, that, the, I mean the global game itself is relatively standard. Um, so the, the global game uh, is simply the looking the at um, pardon? the two steps of the verification, the verifying the identity and then verifying the transaction. Yeah, um, it's. Um, um, I mean that's not, not really very uh, uh, you know very important for the solution, uh, but I think as as Hannah has uh, has shown us, we need to be much more careful about how we model the verification process itself, and uh, you know there's a whole sort of other layer that uh, we have we have uh, you know abstracted from, uh, but uh, you know which would be important if we were to you know implement this Thanks. in real life. So Cyril, uh, Raphael, do you want to come in? No, I think that's that's fine. Thanks. Yeah, same here. So I think we have room for one or two more questions. So who else among our panelists would like to pose a question? So just can you explain again the mechanics of the alpha, how it works, sort of like uh, uh, I mean, delta was sort of important. Delta is kind of proportional to alpha and kind of the gains, you know, the typical beta one minus beta because of the trigger strategy. But I, you didn't have time to explain the mechanics of, of that. Yeah, let me let me leave that to Cyril. So, so alpha is just a it's just the probability of the match. It's basically a surplus uh, parameter. Sorry, I forgot I the see, one that was being caught. Was, uh, on, I think the, the, the one that's well. being being caught. I forgot the the letter, but you know. Yeah, pi is the probability of being caught. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's basically. I mean, it's so. So pi has a very similar uh, impact as the discount factor itself. Um, so, you know, clearly, if you're if you're in an environment where you're likely to be caught, um, then of course you care much more about your future payoffs. So it's literally basically you lose the gains of trade because you, you could get excluded also and then you lose and then you get the, so you lose the gains of trade times the probability times the remaining time. That's just exactly. that condition of the punishment. That's, and then that's what the index the deltas with the different threads. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, so the, so the punchline is that if you're in a, if you're in an environment where uh, it's easy to uh, get away with uh, with, bar uh, with bribery and side payments like this, then you want the reassurance, you want the safeguard of having a distributed ledger system in order to have a more robust governance system. But uh, typically, if you, if, if you look at the, uh, the particular uh, you know, parameterizations, um, for most cases, you're just much better off with a centralized ledger. It's only in these very special cases where uh, you cannot guarantee good governance. Uh, this is when you have uh, the case for distributed ledgers really coming in. I think that's a, a very nice way of uh, wrapping up the, the arguments of the paper in general. I know that um, we have a hard stop for many people at, uh, at the hour. So those of you who uh, would wish to take that, please go ahead. I understand that uh, Cyril is, uh, is able to stay on a bit longer and uh, to answer uh, any further questions of, of those who'd like to stay on for five or 10 minutes. So thank you, everyone, everyone leaving, thank you. And uh, for those staying on, I'll, uh, I'll hand the floor to Rod. I'm going to leave. Um, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Cyril because I uh, actually I've got a hard stop now, so uh, I I better say goodbye. <laughs> it's Thank great you, to you. see everyone. Great to see everyone. Thanks for joining, and uh, and and thanks, Hannah, for the for the great discussion. Thanks, Ian. All right, so we'll turn now to Rod. 
Yeah, sure. I, I was just going to ask a question uh, about the costs. So the costs in this framework, uh, there's no proof of work, of course. So the costs are really just the verification costs uh, of tracking what's in the ledger. And I presume these would be quite low, which I guess is good for the story. Uh, but I was wondering if it matters that these costs would, would be variable. So in the sense that, you know, unlike whereas in something like, you know, proof of work where, the, where they, they can sort of, the protocol automatically adjusts to keep these costs in line with what they want them to be. Here, the cost would be just, what would they, what exactly? I mean, they're the costs of just keeping track of transactions in the ledger. I guess these would vary with the block sizes and with just technological improvements. So I guess my basic question is maybe a little bit more about these costs and what it would mean if they're if they're not constant over time. Sarah, you want to go or I go? Uh, go ahead. So um, I think it's it's reasonable to to assume that you know in, in in many systems we can think they're actually really low, right? They're really these these costs of of operating a node, and and the stochastic uh, the stochastic element we think about it like. As, as connectivity outages or something, right? And that and and the good thing is that really like these these glo this global game set of of, of uh, solution methods works the best with very uh, small costs and a noise that goes to zero. Um, I'm I'm not sure, and that goes back to Charles's comments earlier. If we can also interpret them broadly as 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 monitoring costs. Um, where you know you would you really have a real effort to sort of monitor whether a production really happened, and and you write that it, that would be a bit of an outside ledger interpretation. I think it you know you you can build story where where that could be the interpretation too, but ours is really in line with what you just said. Great. Okay. Uh, further questions from our panelists. So I don't see any more hands. Uh, one more, uh, Bruno, and you're just waving goodbye. <laughs> uh, Bruno, you're muted. I'm going to unmute you quickly. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I'm sorry, I, I I mixed up with times. I thought I was coming right in time. And in fact, I'm, I'm arriving at the end, <laughs> sorry. Anyhow, cost. Uh, it depends on what it is that you want to store on the blockchain. If you want to store, if the only thing you want to store on the blockchain is ownership of coins, um, the, the, the resources it takes to check validity um, are, are, very, are relatively quite small. But if you would like to, 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 to store a more complicated thing, like for example, smart contracts on the blockchain, then checking the validity uh, would, would actually take significant resources. So maybe in the case of a, of a money, of a currency, uh, if we only look at the currency, um, the cost can be deemed to be small, but if you want to enlarge uh, the set of things you want to register on the blockchain, then the cost can become larger. Cyril, would you like to respond to that or Rafael? It's a very good point. It uh, shows, shows uh, Br Bruno Bier's mastership coming at the end of a seminar and answering the question. <laughs> Wonderful. Can I ask a question? So, yeah, Ricardo, please, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing looks a little bit like a, a decentralized credit scoring. Uh, you know, the system we have now is like we have, like, I guess, private companies and they compete and, and you know, people can pay attention to each one of them. Um, is it the same? I don't know, it's the first time I see it like this. Is it the same as the kind of decentralized uh, record keeping? You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it looks, it feels different to me. Um, this is interesting, but I'm not sure it's uh, it's the same as helping us settle transactions. Uh, no, no, so that you're absolutely right. I mean, this is the way we thought about, uh, you know, coins being a change, right? In the sense that, um, I mean, we were thinking about it coming from Narayana's paper, okay, where uh, if the label or the history is correct, I mean, is the history reflects good behavior in the past, then you have the right to trade. So in that sense, you know, this is a, a credit scoring uh, economy, if you want. 
but uh, it was easier to think about it this way than to have coins being uh, exchanged. Uh, but I think the mapping is uh, possible. Yeah, so I think the place where I kind of lost a little bit, uh, I was expecting something more Bitcoin-y like where anonymity goes all the way. But here, you know, you're really not anonymous at all. You can be excluded. So that, that's kind of where the tension is with what I was expecting no, no, to good. see. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's the exact point of the, of this, of keeping history is that you can exclude people. Well, but you can start afresh with a new history. You know what I'm saying? It's different. They're not the same thing. In Bitcoin, you can start a new wallet. I, you can exclude a wallet maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here, so that, that's an interesting point in the sense that here we have agents but you know the way you should think about it is a wallet ID, right? So as soon as you have a wallet that sort of misbehaves, then it's, the wallet is going to be excluded. Except there's no, there's nothing in it. What? Well, yeah. So there, I mean, you can think about it as a proof of stake implementation that way. So I see we have a question from Jacob Leshno as well, Jacob. Yeah, it's, it's more of a comment than a question, but um, I think that really like the all call interpretation makes a lot of sense to me. But if you think of like a ledger like Bitcoin, the validation really plays no role in Bitcoin because anybody who reads the ledger can just ignore blocks that violate the rules of the system. B Bitcoin will work exactly in the same way if you include all the blocks that are in violation of the rules inside the ledger, everybody can copy it and Distribute it. It's just that the reading will just have to ignore the, the non-permissive box. Rafael, Cyril, do you want to respond on that? Uh, Cyril, maybe you do. I had a connectivity problem. Well, so the. Um... So here we are, we're really focusing on the permissioned, you know, uh, protocol, not permissionless, like Bitcoin. So, so maybe just another related comment is that uh, I understand that you want to do uh, you want to do things uh, that involve privacy and don't disclose all the information, and like there are several ways to do that. One of which is to uh, that is fully decentralized. It's called zero knowledge proofs. There are some. There's some companies that try to kind of build this now where you still use an open ledger where everybody can see the ledger and you just use cryptography to hide everything except for the authenticity of the ledger. Um, so for being vague, but it's basically cryptography magic allows you to provide anonymity uh, while still basically using the same way that Bitcoin verifies transactions. And again, every every third party can verify the legality of everything that involves only the ledger. Of course, you need uh, oracles or somebody else to verify whether somebody uh, really did, did well on something in external life. The ledger can only uh, show the record is okay, doesn't say anything about the real life. Bruno, I think you, you have your hand up here. Yes, thank you. I wanted to come back to Ricardo's question, which I thought was very uh, insightful. And so maybe what we, Ricardo is pointing that um, here, I th if I understand your paper, I've read the paper and that's why I'm talking about the paper. <laughs> here you guys, you're talking about central bank digital currency. You're not talking about a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. And I think these are different animals if I'm, if I'm not wrong. And, and, and that's why, why in Bitcoin we have full anonymity. Uh, in, in, in the case of a central bank digital currency, uh, you don't necessarily have full anonymity. In fact, the central bank can very well demand to have some registration uh, of the wallet owners. And so, and that comes to Ricardo's point, which is once you have this registration, then you are in a position to punish the guys if they do the wrong thing. Rafael Cyril, do you agree with that characterization? Uh, well, in, yeah, yes, but in sort of, right, what we, we don't think about it in a, in a way that you can punish them with an ex exogenous mechanism, right? You only have the endogenous mechanism of having people, uh, the participants in that system identified, 
and having the, the threat of kicking them out. And that's what you work with. And we want to examine like how well does this system work in a centralized or in a decentralized manner. So, so I see Hannah. Oh, uh, I don't know if I agree with it, but I like it. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, we'll give Hannah the floor for the last question. Yes. So, so it is related to what Rafael just said, and I actually had a comment on it in my in a slide that I skipped. Um, is yes, you assume that the only pu only punishment that can be exerted, and by the way, the punishment is really for the. Uh, for the validators. Pi is the punishment for the validators. Uh, whereas there, there may be some punishment for the, for the producers by, because they have bad credit, so, they, so nobody will want to trade with them, but who knows. But the punishment Pi is only for the validators for taking bribes. And you assume that the only way to punish is to exclude them from future dealings. But if you know their identities, uh, why can't you punish them more than this? Why can't you levy the fine? With high enough fine, you actually may prevent any incentive to take the bribe because you can, and you can do it by holding in escrow a certain number of the validators uh, benefits before releasing it. So, so that, so this is kind of, this is what you mentioned as related to the stake, uh, to the uh, to proof of stake and, and stake. But this would, this actually would alleviate a lot of the, a lot of the issues in the, uh, that, that you have in the system and would take advantage of the fact that this is a permission system. You seem to be trying not to take advantage as much as you, as much as you can of the permission system and tying your hand behind your hand, uh, your hands behind your back. Yeah, so I think if you if you allow for the possibility for external punishment, then the, the easy, the straightforward is result is you can achieve first best with a central validator, right? I think then then you you run a fully centralized system. That's the axiomatic result. No, but when you exclude them, it is also external punishment. Yeah, so here they are excluded. So this is the worst punishment you can get for these guys. So this is what you assume. Why wouldn't you yeah. be able to put the fine for them? It's, it's just as external as excluding. Somebody needs to exclude them. There is a mechanism, there's a centralized mechanism that gives the per permission. So basically, right? if you were to put capital, right, you would be able to achieve a stronger punishment because they would lose the capital. And on top of that, they would be excluded. Yes. OK. Thanks, Anna. I think that these are these are good points, and I think that there is ample uh, material for discussion on these topics. Still, I'd like to thank everyone again for taking part. With many thanks to uh, to the authors and uh, and also to our discussant. I understand that Todd will uh, give us a few words to close. Yes, thanks, John, and thanks again to Hune, Cyril, Raphael, and Hannah for getting our new series off to a great start today. Thanks to everyone for for participating. So you'll be able to find the slides as well as a link to the video of today's event on our website, cbandc.net. There's a link to that site in the email you received with a link to today's event. And we hope you'll join us again next month, April 30th, when the ECB will host our, our next event. Martin Schneider will present, um, Dirk Niepelt will be the discussant, and Katrin uh, Ossenmacher will be our, our moderator. Until then, I hope everyone has a pleasant morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you very much to all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I think the discussion is fantastic. Uh, so, hey, um, Russell, are we able to stop the YouTube stream? <laughs>